Aloha Airlines 243 has just suffered what experts call an explosive decompression. The air inside the plane that makes jet flight possible escapes in a sudden horrifying moment. 35 square meters of the fuselage are gone. Just imagine the scene up there. The top of the airplane broken off. You now have 300 mile an hour winds blowing into that cabin. That's three times hurricane force winds. Those people were dressed for Hawaii in the springtime, not minus 50 degree temperatures. Any period of time at 24,000 feet, and those people will die. What was that? You have to get down! Captain Bob Schornsteimer begins an emergency descent, dropping 20 meters a second. The stress on the damaged craft threatens to tear it apart. A woman that was sitting next to me and her husband, he was on the other side in the next row up. She was next to me and they were reaching their hands out and they were trying to touch fingers to say goodbye. Against incredible odds, the flight crew land their bruised and battered airplane. Even with this explosive decompression, there's only one death on Aloha Flight 243 a flight attendant who was pulled out of the plane. Jim Wildey investigates the crash for the National Transportation Safety Board. In his laboratory, Wildey makes a disturbing discovery. Running through some of the pieces of the plane's fuselage, he finds a series of hairline cracks. They're right beside the holes created by rivets and barely visible to the naked eye. But they're classic signs of metal fatigue. A plane isn't a rock-solid tube. To maintain the pressure passengers need to enjoy a flight, it's designed to be much more flexible. The fuselage of the airplane is actually breathing. It expands and contracts depending on altitude. When it's on the ground, it's in a contracted status. When it's at altitude, 24,000 feet, the fuselage expands. So the airplane is constantly cycling. That's pressurization. That will weaken the structure over a long period of time. Records show that the Aloha jet was 19 years old. 737s are designed for a 20-year service life and are recommended 75,000 flights. But as investigators take a closer look, they discover that the Aloha jet had logged an astonishing 89,000 separate flights. The short hops between the Hawaiian Islands meant that the planes in the Aloha fleet went through more pressurization cycles than any other aircraft. You saw something as you got on this airplane. What did you see? Investigator Jim Wildey gets a lead when he interviews one of the Aloha passengers. She says she saw a small crack in the fuselage just to the right of the door. The witness saw cracking in this area, and we found fatigue cracking back in here. So this is the line where the fatigue cracking joined up. One piece came down this way and folded off, and the other piece went across the top and came off to the right side. But something doesn't make sense. The Aloha jet lost 35 square meters of its fuselage. In the years after the Comet disaster, Boeing and other companies had designed a safety feature that should have kept any tearing to an absolute minimum. Inside the fuselage of every 737, Boeing has installed a series of tear straps. If any kind of tear develops in the fuselage, it should only run as far as the next tear strap, never more than 13 centimeters away, before shooting off at a 90 degree angle. This would have prevented the sort of catastrophic disintegration that ripped apart the comet. The purpose of the tear strip is to confine any kind of rip or tear in the fuselage skin to a 10-inch square, basically. The 10-inch square allows a controlled decompression and confines any structural damage to a very small area. But for Aloha 243, the tear straps did not contain the rupture caused by the metal fatigue. The NTSB believes there were so many cracks in the fuselage that they eventually joined together, tearing an enormous hole in the plane. But jets aren't held together by rivets alone. The Comet disaster had also highlighted the need to reinforce the fuselage. The skin of an airplane is built from separate panels, which overlap. These panels are bonded together by a powerful adhesive known as epoxy. As the epoxy hardens, the panels are locked together by rivets. 
And during his investigation on the Aloha fuselage, Jim Wildey finds discoloration inside some of the overlapping joints. You can see now where the dark material is the epoxy that was used to bond the two layers of the lap joint together. The white material you see here is corrosion damage of the aluminum fuselage skin. The Hawaiian climate is great for tourists, but it's tough on airplanes. The ocean air is humid and heavy with salt. It can corrode even industrial epoxy. Investigators learned that Boeing, the company that built Aloha 243, had issued numerous written warnings about the epoxy. If it isn't applied at the right temperature, if the panels have moisture or dirt on them, the bonding can fail. Boeing recommended regular detailed inspections, but workers at Aloha didn't report any problems with the epoxy. They either never saw the compromised epoxy, or if they did, it wasn't repaired. The Aloha accident was another step towards making passenger jets safer. It's important to always learn from your mistakes. It's important to learn lessons from that. And uh, that has been the case with aeronautical engineering. The Aloha story was a brutal lesson in the dangers of metal fatigue. But it wasn't the last example of the power of cabin pressure. Two years later, the industry would get another terrifying reminder. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. My name is Tim Lancaster. Welcome aboard this British Airways flight to Malaga. June the 10th, 1990. British Airways flight 5390 is leaving Birmingham, England for Spain. 87 people are on board. 80 knots. Two minutes into the climb, the flight crew switch on the autopilot. Captain Tim Lancaster takes off his shoulder straps. Now I went into the flight deck to ask uh, Tim and Alistair what they would like to drink. You gentlemen, like a tea? Please, the usual. Minutes later, at 5,200 meters, the plane is very close to its assigned altitude. And then, like a cork out of a champagne bottle, the windshield bursts from its frame. <laughs> Captain Tim Lancaster is sucked out of his seat and is pinned to the fuselage by blistering winds roaring close to 550 kilometers an hour. The temperature is minus 17 degrees centigrade and there's very little oxygen. Co-pilot Alistair Acheson is alone at the controls. Ordinarily, cockpit windows cannot budge from their frames. The force of the air as the plane soars through the sky pushes the windshield onto the plane. But on flight 5390, something has gone terribly wrong. Flight attendant Nigel Ogden rushes in to help. And I looked in, the flight deck door was resting on the controls, and all I could see was Tim out the window. I just grabbed him before he went out completely. Other flight attendants do what they can. Co-pilot Alistair Acheson reduces speed and descends quickly. But as he slows the plane down, the drop in wind pressure lets the captain slide around on the side of the plane. All I remember is Tim's arms flailing out. His arms seemed about six foot long. And he's, I'll never forget that. His eyes were wide open. I mean, his face was hitting the side of the side screen. But he didn't blink. And I, I, I thought to myself and I said to John, I said, I think he's dead. I think he's dead. Just 35 minutes after taking off, Acheson gets his jet safely back on the ground.
But the most unbelievable chapter of this entire story is the fact that Captain Tim Lancaster survives his incredible ordeal. But I remember watching the windscreen move away from the aircraft and then it had gone like a bullet. It disappeared into the, into the distance. And I was very conscious of going upwards. And, uh, well, the whole thing became completely surreal then, as it would. And uh, I was aware of being outside of the aeroplane. I can remember seeing the tail of the aircraft. I can remember the engines going round. And, uh, and then I don't remember much more. Tim Lancaster was pinned to the outside of the plane for over 20 minutes. His injuries were surprisingly minor. Bone fractures in his right arm and wrist, frostbite and shock. Within five months, Tim Lancaster was flying again. In the immediate aftermath, investigators have very little to go on. The windscreen was missing. There was a certain amount of blood around. There were some minor dents and scrapes on the fuselage, as you'd expect if the window had gone past. And really, that was about it, apart from a lot of paper scattered around inside. The maintenance log is recovered from the plane. Stuart Culling learns the windscreen had been replaced just hours before takeoff. Everything okay? Fine. She's just come out of maintenance by the look of it. Nothing much there. Just changed the windscreen. I wanted to find out exactly what had happened to the aircraft before it took off. Early in the investigation, the missing windscreen is found. It contains a curious piece of evidence. There were something like 30 bolts found with it, most of which were one size short in diameter, one size too small in diameter. On many planes, windscreens are fitted from inside the cockpit. Internal cabin pressure pushes against them, keeping them in place. But on the BAC-111, the windscreen is bolted from the outside. The pressurized oxygen inside the jet pushes out against the windscreen. The bolts must resist this pressure. There are enough of them there that they simply can't pull out of the structure. But of course, if you then violate the very premise of that by putting the wrong bolts on, all bets are off. You're now a test pilot. He's, he's, During his interview with the ground shot. engineer who repaired the plane, oh, Culling gets a major break. One thing that came out was that he said, oh, the old bolts went into a waste bin in the hangar where he did the job, and they may still be there. So we rushed across to the waste bin and found something like 80 discarded bolts. The old bolts are the proper size. Why were smaller bolts used to replace them? And these are the ones you checked against the new ones. That's right. Yeah, I took from the carousel. Got it was them. really excellent evidence. Gold, as far as I was concerned. Instead of using the old bolts to put the new window on, the ground engineer decided to replace them. He did not check the parts catalogue to verify which bolt he needed for the job. Morning. The bolts he chose seemed the same, but in fact were just over half a millimetre smaller. They were too thin to do the job. Early in the morning, working against the side of a hangar, the engineer couldn't tell the difference. Hours later, the window gave way. Faced with a challenge they weren't trained for, the crew still managed to pull their plane back from the brink. But the massive pressure inside an airplane doesn't need bad maintenance to rip a jet apart. 